Good morning to each one. So good to see you. We're blessed with visitors this morning. Thank you so much for coming and being with us to study God's Word together, worship together. We invite you to take your Bibles out and be open to the book of Acts, chapter 17. Acts chapter 17. Among our visitors are our good friends, Brandon and Erica Smith, and their three children, Jody and Mason and William. And they have made a a big life-changing move and decision to leave Texas and come to beautiful Tennessee. Not that Texas is not beautiful, but where they lived and where we lived, it's definitely, I think we'd all agree, more beautiful in this area of, of our country that God has blessed us with. But we're so thankful to have them uh, here, and uh, I know you'll, you have already, many of you have welcomed them, and those who haven't had an opportunity maybe to meet them yet, uh, please do so and make them feel right at home. Acts chapter 17, Paul is on his second preaching journey when we come to the 17th chapter of Acts, and he has Silas with him, he has Timothy with him, and they come to Thessalonica, preach the gospel, a local church is established, they come to Berea and they're even more warmly received by the Jews there in the synagogue. And then, but there's persecution in, in pretty much every place that Paul goes to, and he has to leave Thessalonica and go to Berea. He has to leave Berea because of the Jews who disbelieved and came and stirred up trouble there. And he comes to Athens. And it's in Athens that we want to join him just briefly as we introduce our lesson this morning. In Acts 17 and verse 16, as Paul was waiting for his traveling companions, his preaching companions, uh, Silas and Timothy, it says, now while Paul waited for them at Athens, his spirit was provoked within him when he saw that the city was given over to idols. It's a city that was given over to idolatry. Everywhere he turned, everywhere he looked, as he walked through the city of Athens, there's another god, a false god. And so later he's given the opportunity to preach to the Athenians and of course, he takes advantage of that opportunity. Verse 22, then Paul stood in the midst of the Areopagus or Mars Hill and said, men of Athens, I perceive that in all things you are very religious. For as I was passing through and considering the objects of your worship, I even found an altar with this inscription to the unknown God. Therefore, the one whom you worship without knowing him, I proclaim to you. You know, according to the Bible, and this is just one of the passages that brings this out, a person or even a group of people can be very religious, as Paul describes the Athenians here, and yet be very wrong. And throughout our lesson this morning, I want each of us to consider the following question, is my religion, is my religious beliefs and practices in my life, are they true or are they false? And now I understand when we ask that question or when I pose that question that we might instinctively and rather easily think of others that we know or at least know of that we believe this lesson would readily apply to, especially in the religious world at large. But I hope you will see by the time that we conclude our lesson that there is much application for us, God's people as well, to consider well, do I serve a true or false God? A true or false God? We certainly know that those in the Old Testament days and those in the New Testament days, we read through our Bible, Law of Moses, Law of Christ, we read of those who worship false gods. In fact, we just did it there briefly in Acts 17 when Paul came to Athens, a city given over to idols, to idolatry, and then later in chapter 19, you remember the trouble stirred up by the silversmiths who made images for Diana. There was the temple of Diana in Ephesus. It was considered one of the great wonders of the ancient world. And so many of the places that Paul and Barnabas and Silas and Timothy and Luke and others like them traveled to, they would come to these Gentile cities because it was a Gentile world. It was the Roman Empire influenced by the Greeks before, who worshipped and believed in many gods. In fact, we mentioned Thessalonica at the beginning of Acts 17. Paul wrote two letters to the church established there. 
And if you'll notice in your New Testaments in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 9, Paul says, For they themselves declare concerning us what manner of entry we had to you, and how you turned to God from idols, notice this last part, to serve the living and true God. So they've been serving gods, we might say, with the lowercase. They've been serving these idols, these images of silver and gold and going to their temples of worship dedicated to those gods and goddesses. And they've been bowing down before them, believing that they were really real, true gods. But now they have been convinced of, as Paul spoke of in Acts 17, now let me talk to you about the God you worship without knowing, the true and living God. God. Romans chapter 1, if you'll notice with me there too, please. Romans 1 and verses 20 through 25. We read, therefore, since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse, because although they knew God, they did not glorify Him as God, nor were thankful, but became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools, and changed the glory of the incorruptible God, notice into what? An image made like corruptible man, birds and four-footed animals and creeping things. That's what they made some of their images that they worshipped out of, to resemble a man, to resemble animals. Therefore God also gave them up to uncleanness and the lust of their hearts to dishonor their bodies among themselves who exchanged the truth of God for the lie and worshipped and served the creature rather than the Creator who is blessed forever. Amen. And so... We think of the ancient world and we read in the scriptures of those who served these gods. And yet, here in the 21st century, sometimes maybe we forget that it's something that's still prevalent in our world today. It's something that can still be found. It's not just something that belonged to ancient civilizations. It may not be as prevalent as it was in the days of Christ and the apostles, but it's still there. Think, consider of uh, Hinduism, for example. The religion of Hinduism, they believe in many gods. And there are many Hindus throughout the world. You think of the religion of Islam. They believe in their god who they call Allah. And they believe that the, in the beloved prophet Muhammad, as they would refer to. And even Catholicism, though those I've talked to would deny it, I think the evidence and the fruits of it is apparent with their many images and statues statues and their places of worship, some of which they pray to. And then some worship today, don't they, in our country and around the world, some worship the earth or nature itself. We even had recently Earth Day. Uh, We had it the day, uh, Sunday I started, well, I didn't start it. I guess I started it on a a Friday. But when I was in Texas recently, uh, it was... It was Earth Day during that gospel meeting. And again, that's those who uh, worship more what the Creator has created than honoring the Creator Himself. Not instead of worshiping God, they are worships, worshipers of nature. And others in the world have in essence made themselves to be God, a God, in that they serve themselves and their selfish desire. So idolatry is alive and well today. In fact, the Christian must be on guard against idolatry. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 14, Paul writes to the saints in Corinth and says, therefore, my beloved, flee from idolatry. Now, certainly they came from that background. And 1 John chapter 5, this is how John ends his first epistle. 1 John 5, 21, little children, keep yourselves from idols. And again, we might say, well, I don't have any idols in my life. I don't have any idols in my home. I don't have any of those statutes I uh, bow down to. Well, really? Maybe so. Maybe you do. Anything that comes between us and God, 
and our hearts as an idol. And you think about that. You know what Paul said in Colossians chapter 3 and verse 5, right? As he talks about putting off the old man and those sinful deeds and putting on the new man, he says, Therefore put to death your members which are on the earth, fornication, uncleanness, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is what? Put to death covetousness, which is idolatry. Now, what's covetousness? Well, it's not an actual image made to look like a man or a woman or an animal and four-footed creature that people bow down to, but covetousness is greed. I want more. I long for more. Remember what Jesus said in Luke 12, 15, take heed and beware of covetousness for one's life does not consist in what? The abundance of the things he possesses. We possess a lot, don't we? And we begin, we can become, begin to put our trust in those things into our bank account, into our retirement accounts, into our cars and our trucks and our RVs and our homes and our clothes and our, and our TVs and our things that we have and uh, other affections of the heart that we have to be very careful about. And so, yeah, we can think of others. Yeah, they got a problem with this and maybe I have a problem with this. Maybe you have a problem with this. Do we serve the true God or is there a false God in our heart? that needs to be removed. True or false religion, which is it for us? Do I have a true or false worship? Notice with me in John chapter 4, please. <clears throat> Again, John chapter 4. In the fourth chapter of John, we find Jesus in Samaria... And I think many in our audience are, are familiar with this text, some maybe not, but when he came to Samaria, he came to Jacob's well, he sat down to rest, and a woman, a Samaritan woman, came to draw water. Jesus begins to converse with this woman, and back and forth, they're talking about various things. Eventually, the subject of worship is brought up, and that's where we want to join the conversation. So because of some things Jesus revealed about her personal life and how many husbands she had and the man she was with right now in her life was not her husband, she perceived that he was a prophet, verse 19. And then she said this in verse 20, Our fathers worshipped on this mountain, Mount Gerizim, close by there. And you Jews say that in Jerusalem is the place where one ought to worship. Jesus responded by saying to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you will neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem worship the Father. He then says this, You worship what you do not know. What do you think that says about her worship, this marriage worship? Was it true or false? Jesus Christ, the Son of God, just said to her, You worship what you do not know. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. But the hour is coming and now is when the true worshipers will worship, how? Will worship the Father in spirit and truth, for the Father is seeking such to worship Him. God is spirit, and those who worship Him must worship in spirit and truth. Well, here's the thing. Jesus mentions in verse 23, the hour is coming and now is when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. Well, if there's true worshipers, that implies all others would be false worshipers. Is my worship true, or is it or is it false? Hers was false. The Samaritan's was false. But mine could be, yours could be, if it's not according to what Jesus says here and repeats it, verse 23, then repeats it, verse 24, that those who worship God must worship Him in spirit and truth. And God is seeking such to worship Him. You know, the very first occasion recorded in the Bible about worshiping God, we have an example of true worship and false worship. We have a worship that was accepted and respected, right, Abel's, by God. And we have a worship that was not respected and thus rejected by God, what Cain did. And Cain became angry. And God talked to him about that. He's, he says about his anger, and he said, why are you angry? Why is your countenance fallen there in Genesis 4? And Cain said to God in response, or, or, or excuse me, Cain didn't say anything there in response. God continued and said to Cain, if you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin lies at the door and its desire is for you, but you should rule over it. Well, he didn't rule over it, and he allowed that anger to boil over where he rose up and killed his brother Abel. You think about that, and that all was connected to worship. That was about worship. 
It was about true worship and false worship, and God accepted what was true and didn't accept what was false. But he would have accepted Cain if he would do well, if he did what God instructed. God is seeking such to worship him. I think about Nadab and Abihu in Leviticus chapter 10, the sons of Aaron, the nephews of Moses. They're priests of God, and they're to be burning incense, and they were, but it says they used a strange fire or a profane fire, which God had not commanded them, Leviticus 10, 1 and 2. God sent fire down and consumed those two young men, and they died there. God, through Moses to Aaron, goes on to say, by those who come near me, I must be glorified, and before all the people, I must be, I must be honored. And he wasn't because he wasn't being given true worship, but a worship he had not commanded or revealed. Or think about as what we read Jesus say in Matthew 15 in the New Testament to the Jewish rulers, to the scribes and Pharisees that had come to him. We we know that from verse 1. As they begin complaining and criticizing him and his disciples, they're not keeping the tradition of of the elders. Well, Jesus is not... Jesus is not concerned with keeping man-made laws. He's concerned with himself and those he's teaching with keeping God's law, God's commandments. And so he calls them out. He says, you're hypocrites. Isaiah prophesied about you saying, these people draw near to me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. And in vain they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. And so their worship was not in spirit and truth. They say some good things off their lips, their hearts far from me. In vain they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. Not the commandments of God, but the commandments of men. And again, we can can readily see, right, how this passage, this scripture applies greatly to so many in the religious world Uh, today in general with the unauthorized worship that is commonly offered to God but does it not find application with the children of God as well? Of course it does and it should. We may be able to go through the checklist of the items of New Testament worship and check them off but what about our attitude when we assemble for worship? You remember Malachi chapter 1, last book of the Old Testament God's people were coming to worship services, right? They were bringing their sacrifices. And even what they were bringing was described as blind at times, lame, diseased, even stolen. But some had the attitude where they were even, to do that, put out. Oh, what a weariness, Malachi 1.13 was some of their attitude, and they sneered at it at the offering and the worship of God. Oh, what a weariness. I mean, sometimes <laughs> perhaps God's people today have that attitude and we have to guard against it. You think about 168 hours in a week and typically only about three on Sunday, four drive time, maybe five total out of 168 of a typical week of assembling with the saints How dare we ever develop an attitude of, oh, what a weariness to come here, to be here, to worship God. And so, again, we might go through, yep, we we, we worship God according to the truth. I can check that off. But what about our spirit? What about our attitude? You know, David said in Psalm 122 and verse 1 that he was glad when they said, let us go to the house of the Lord. I was glad. I was happy. I was filled with joy. And that's how we should be every Lord's Day. And every time we have an opportunity and blessing to assemble. But are we happy to be here? And when we're here, are we focused on what we're doing? We don't just have to be a child to be easily distracted, for our minds to wander, to lose focus. And we almost sometimes continually have to bring ourselves back to why we're here, to worship God in spirit and truth, to study His word together as we're striving to do right now. Are we giving the Lord our best? Am I giving him true worship? Think about that. Well, I did what he said to do. Well, is it from the heart? Is it genuine? Is it like those in the days of Malachi? Well, I would never do that. I would never give the Lord, if I lived at that time, an animal that was lame 
I wouldn't do that. I certainly wouldn't steal a, a goat or a lamb from my neighbor to give to God. Well, would you come here and not give him your best? Would you come here and kind of give a half-hearted effort? Then maybe we're not too far removed from those in Malachi chapter 1, after all, if we would do such. Are we merely going through the motions? Are we anxious to leave? We need to check our heart and our attitude. What about this? Am I a true or false Christian? A true or false Christian? Acts chapter 11. If you'll go there with me, please. <clears throat> In Acts 11... We read, for the first time in the New Testament, disciples of Christ being identified as Christians. We read there, as Luke records for us, and when he had found him, this is Barnabas, he was seeking Saul, who his name doesn't change till chapter 13 to Paul. But he brought him to Antioch, so it was that for a whole year they assembled with the church and taught a great many people, and the disciples were first called Christians in Antioch. It's an interesting word there, called. Literally means to, it was a divinely appointed name. It wasn't, you know, sometimes it's been um, misunderstood or falsely stated that, well, that name Christian was given as a name of derision. And, and so, uh, in other words, it was given by the enemies. No, it was given by God. Even Isaiah prophesied that his people would be given a new name. Twice he prophesied that uh, in, in the book of Isaiah, 700 years before Christ. So it's a divinely appointed name. This is what, and it makes sense. You got the name Christ in that, right? You got followers of Christ here. Disciples appropriate, disciples of Christ, but Christians. And we know that many, many people today claim to be Christians who are not simply because they have not obeyed the, the gospel of Christ and therefore they're not saved. As Jesus said, sent his apostles into the world to preach the gospel to every creature and he who believes and is baptized shall be saved. He who disbelieves shall be condemned. And how Paul said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ for it is the power of God to salvation to everyone who believes to the Jew first and also to the Greek. And so we must hear the gospel and believe the gospel and be baptized into Christ for the remission of our sins. And when that, when that happens, we read of how the, the, those who did so in Acts 2, that the Lord added uh, to the church daily those who are being saved and how we're baptized into that one body, that one body, the Lord's church, 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 13. And so we realize there's many today that would identify themselves as a Christian, but they're not New Testament Christians. They haven't been taught and they haven't believed and obeyed the gospel of Christ as we read in the Bible in the New Testament. But also there are some who have obeyed the gospel of Christ. They are in fact New Testament Christians, but it is merely an identification and a religion that they profess and not one that they live sadly. Jesus asked of some, Luke 6, 46, and obviously these are were people who claimed to be connected to him, following him. Their allegiance was being professed to be connected to him. But why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do the things which I say? Okay, These weren't people denying him, saying, I don't want anything to do with you. But Jesus was calling some out. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, that I'm your master, that I have authority over you in your life, but you're not even doing what I teach? That doesn't connect. It doesn't make sense. Or as he said in Matthew 7, verse 21, But not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. So again, here's those who are calling him their Lord, their master. They said, just because you say that doesn't mean you're going to heaven. You have to do the will of my Father in heaven. You have to live it. You have to abide by my teachings and the teachings of my heavenly Father. Think about what James wrote to Christians in James chapter 1. 
And again, if he was writing this to Christians, and he was, then it's something that I need to hear, something you need to hear, something that will benefit us if we take it to heart and make application. Verse 21, beginning in James 1, Therefore lay aside all filthiness and overflow of wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your soul. So let me pause there. We have to rid our lives of any sin, lay aside all filthiness and overflow wickedness. Then what can we do? We can receive with humility or meekness God's implanted word into our hearts, into our minds and lives, and it's able to save our souls. He, so he says, but be doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. Kind of like what Jesus said in Luke 6, 46. But why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do the things which I say? So be doers of the word, not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. Verse 23, for if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he's like a man observing his natural face in a mirror. For he observes himself, goes away, and immediately forgets what kind of man he was. But he who looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues in it and is not a forgetful hearer but a doer of the work, this one will be blessed in what he does. Is that me? Is that you? Are we a true or false Christian? Well, I've been baptized. I've obeyed the gospel. And that's very important, very important. But am I living the life of a Christian or am I just claiming to be? Right? Am I living and abiding by the teachings of Christ? Am I continuing in the perfect law of liberty? That's the question we're asking. And that's the question we want to answer and must do that individually. Am I a true or false teacher? Of course, the Bible speaks many times of false prophets, false teachers. Peter does. He mentions both. He kind of seems to look back to the former times of the Old Testament and the present times when he says, but there were also false prophets, <clears throat> excuse me, among the people, even as there will be false teachers among you. So false teachers, that's a reality. False prophets was a reality. Those who teach something contrary to God's word, he says, who will bring in, who will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the Lord who bought them and bring on themselves swift destruction. First John chapter four and verse one, John writes, "Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits whether they be of God. For many false prophets have gone out into the world." What many false prophets, many false teachers have gone out into the world. So you've got to test the spirits. The members here and the visitors here, you need to test mine. You need to test mine. Many of you I know and many of you know me, but it doesn't mean, okay, well, we know Jesse, we like him, we trust him. That's so why you need to have this out and, and check whoever's teaching, whoever's preaching. Make sure what they're saying lines up with the Word of God because many false prophets have gone into the world. There's a spirit of truth and a spirit of error, 1 John 4, 6. And if we hear the inspired apostles, then we, we will be of the truth, John says. You know, and so there are t true teachers of God's word, and the, there are those who teach false or contrary things to the word of God, Romans 16, 17. Uh, Paul speaks of that. Again, Romans 16, Chapter 16, verse 17, please notice that the Apostle Paul writes to the saints in Rome. He says, Now I urge you, brethren, note those who cause divisions and offenses, contrary, notice, to the doctrine which you learned, and avoid them. No, notice who is causing the divisions among them and the offenses. Offense means to cause one to stumble. It's those who are teaching things contrary to the doctrine of Christ. You need to note them. You need to mark them. You need to avoid them. 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 10. 1 Timothy chapter 1 verse 10. It talks about those who practice what is unlawful. In verses 9 and 10, he says, For fornicators, for sodomites, for kidnappers, for liars, for perjurers, and if there is any other thing that notice is contrary to what? Sound doctrine. 
There is sound doctrine. You think of somebody as sound. It speaks of health. They're wholesome. They're well. It's true. And then there's unsound doctrine then. We want sound doctrine. And we want to be teaching and practicing and believing in what is sound, what is true, and not what is false. You know, the Bible speaks of the New Testament, it speaks of false brethren. 2 Corinthians eleven twenty six, 26, Galatians 2, 4, Paul referred to false brethren. So there can be brethren in the Lord's church that are false because of what they believe, what they teach, what they practice. And I need to examine myself. Do I hold to an understanding uh, of the scriptures, the Bible, uh, a doctrine that is unsound, that is not wholesome, words that is false? And so I need to get, get rid of that. I need to get that out of my mind, out of my heart, and embrace that which is true and what is sound. And am I a true or false member? You know, perhaps it could also be said that there are true members and false members of a local church. And when I say that, I'm talking about a local church where we worship, where we attend and assemble regularly, that we've identified ourselves with, that we've joined, that we're participants in that local work. Whether you don't prefer that particular word or not, you know what I, I mean by that and express it uh, the way maybe that you prefer. But in other words, there are those who are faithful and diligent participants in the worship, in the Bible class. They're workers in the congregation. However, there are some who identify as members of a particular local church but do little to nothing to contribute to the Lord's work there. You know, Paul describes some in 1 Corinthians 11, verse 30, just a little below what Daniel referenced this morning. He describes some there in the church at Corinth as being weak, as being sick, and he said, many sleep, many are dead. Now, in the context of that verse... He's talking about partaking of the Lord's Supper in an unworthy way, and some were taken in an unworthy manner there in Corinth. That's what he was correcting there, part of what he was correcting there in chapter 11. And so he's not describing people who are physically weak, people who are physically sick, people who have died. That's happened here in this congregation, right? And that's true of any congregation that you're going to have some who are physically weak and sick. But he's talking spiritually. And he says, that's the case of some of you there in Corinth. Some are weak there. Some are spiritually sick there. Some are even dead there. In fact, that's exactly how he describes the church at Sardis. And Sean read that text for us. The whole message was just verses 1 through 6 that Christ addressed this church. You've got a name that you're alive, but in reality, you're dead. Think about that. That's a pretty profound and harsh rebuke. Here's Christ saying to his professed followers in the city of Sardis and that church, yeah, you got a name, maybe you got a sign out there that you're alive and you're still assembling, but spiritually you're dead. Your works are not perfect before me. And so that's a sobering thought. And the saints that made up the church in Laodicea, Revelation 3, 15 and 16, were described by Christ there, you're lukewarm, you're neither cold nor hot. And because you're lukewarm, I'm going to vomit you out of my mouth. And he goes on in verse 19, he says, Many as I love, I rebuke and chasten, therefore repent and be zealous. You see what I mean by, am I a true or false member? Well, I've been baptized. I'm a member of this local church. Well, what kind of member am I? Am I weak spiritually? Is there a spiritual sickness in my life? If I reach the point where I could be described even as dead, as though some in Corinth and some in Sardis were, am I lukewarm? I've lost my zeal for the Lord? We have to do some inward and honest reflection on that. If you're a member of this local church, identified yourself with this specific group of Christians, then be involved. Be involved in the work that goes on here. When appropriate, be involved in the men's meetings. When appropriate, be involved in the men's class. When appropriate, be involved in the ladies' class. 
be involved in the exhortation meeting that's meant to encourage and stir us up to love and good works, be involved in the children's training class, be involved in the young men's leadership class, be involved by attending all the services of our upcoming gospel meeting with Stephen Deaton, be involved with attending and participating in our weekly Bible classes on Sunday and Wednesday, be involved by coming to both services, worship services on Sunday, be actively, eagerly, and joyfully involved in the Lord's work. Each member, each part doing our share for the growth and edification of this church. Be steadfast, immovable, always abound in the work of the Lord, knowing that your work in the Lord is not in vain. Am I, are you a true or a false member here? Think about that. We've been talking about true and false. I think about what Jesus said in John 8 about the truth. Verse 31, then Jesus said to those Jews who believed him, if you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Truth makes one free from sin. Error does not. Things that are false do not. And as we read in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 22 and 23, the apostle Peter wrote, since you have noticed, purified your souls. How do they purify their souls? In obeying the truth. The truth that will set you free from sin. Through the Spirit, in sincere love of the brethren, love one another fervently with a pure heart, having been born again, not of corruptible seed, but incorruptible, through the Word of God, which lives and abides forever. Has your soul been purified from sin yet? Have you obeyed the truth? That's what will do it. Obeying the truth of God, the truth of Christ. Do you know the truth that will set you free from sin? If not, which you would like to know, We'd love to study the Bible with you. Just say something to us. and We'll make arrangements today or at your earliest convenience to do that. Nothing more we'd love to do than sit down with open hearts and open Bibles and search the Scriptures together to find the truth that will set us free from sin. But if you understand that already this morning, that you need to believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, repent of your sins, confess faith in Him that He is the Christ, and be buried with Him in baptism to have thy sins washed away, then don't delay Act upon that this morning and be saved. Become a New Testament Christian. If you are a child of God but there's sin in your life, then you need to confess that, repent of it, and turn to God before it's everlasting too late. If we can help you, assist you in any way spiritually, let us know as we stand and as we sing.